So I was the chair of the ACM IEEE CS Eckert Mokley Award. And uh, you know, the Eckert Mokley Award is given annually for contributions to computer and digital systems architecture, where the field of computer architecture is considered at present to encompass the combined hardware and software design and analysis of computing and digital systems. And uh, the other members of the uh, committee were Sandia Dwakadas, David Wood, Livan Eckert Hout, Paolo Fabra Boschi, and Norm Jupi. And uh, so, you know, thanks to all the work that they did, they did an excellent job. And so, it gives me uh, distinct pleasure uh, to announce uh, that the award recipient this year is uh, Professor Susan Aggers uh, from the uh, University of Washington. She's currently an emeritus uh, professor, emerita professor at the University of Washington. And the citation reads, for outstanding contributions to simultaneous multi-threaded processor architectures and multiprocessor sharing and coherency. So, congratulations. <laughs> Before she comes up, uh, let me say a few words about her, of introduction, you know, for, you know. Um, of course most of you know who she is, but uh, for those of you who don't, uh, you should, and uh, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Professor Eggers. So uh, Professor Eggers uh, received a bachelor's degree in economics from the Connecticut College for Women in 1965. Uh, it was only in 1983 that she came back uh, to the Berkeley University of uh, uh, California, Berkeley, on a special program for reentry of women for uh, reentry program for women, and she retooled herself as a computer engineer, and then entered the PhD program in 1984. And uh, while at Berkeley, she worked with uh, Randy Katz, and uh, she performed one of the first studies on uh, data sharing on shared multiprocessors. Uh, providing crucial insights into the relationship between program data, access patterns, coherency protocols, and cache performance. Uh, you know, it was this work, you know, that we get the, the term full sharing from, right? And so everybody teaches full sharing in their uh, parallel computing and parallel uh, uh, architecture courses. And it basically, this is the work that significantly enhanced our understanding of both hardware and coherency techniques. In 1989, Professor Eggers began her academic career at the University of Washington, and uh, in a period of two decades after that, period of intense work, she became <coughs> one of the nation's leading computer architects. Uh, while at Washington, uh, Professor Eggers uh, started the Simultaneous Multi-Threading threading, or SMT project in 1994, and went on to lead numerous studies the broadly explored SMT. Now, of course, SMT is one of the uh, most important innovations in computer architecture, especially micro architecture of uh, processes, and it's had a significant impact uh, on both industry and academia. Uh, you know, decades later, two, you know, you know, two decades after uh, the first ideas, you know, both Intel's and IBM's latest architectures, you know, incorporate SMT. And to add a uh, personal note, uh, recent Spark processes also have SMT in them too. Uh, so I would note that uh, you know, you know, the initial uh, reception of SMT was not, uh, uh, let, let us say, completely welcoming, and uh, you know, uh, by the computer, computer architecture community. And uh, so, but uh, led by Eggers, she and her co-authors responded to the resistance with a series of studies that thoroughly prove the benefit and practicality of the concept. <clears throat> Eggers published dozens of papers uh, covering issues uh, on SMT from low-level instruction fetch, hardware to synchronization, to parallel programming and compiler techniques, to database implications and implications to operating systems. Two of these papers were awarded back-to-back uh, -back ISCA Most Influential Paper Awards in 2010 and 2011. Professor Eggers has been recognized nationally uh, for her uh, 
accomplishments uh, by an election to the National Academy of Engineering in 2006, 2006, 2006. in 2013, she was, uh, she uh, became a member of the Academy, uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a fellow of the IEEE and a fellow of the ACM. In 2009, UC Berkeley at EECS presented her with the University of California Distinguished Alumni Award. <clears throat> okay, and so now, of course, uh, she, her, her accomplishments, accomplishments have been recognized with a Eckert Morkley Award. So at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, have the pleasure of presenting the award to Susan Eggers. So I've been, I've been retired for almost a decade, and my conference attending ended uh, when I retired. Um, I'm not going to give a technical, I have to say close to this, I'm not going to give a technical talk. Uh, you will actually be, should be delighted to hear that. <laughs> Ten years is a long time to be away. Uh, but I do have a few remarks. I'd like to, of course, thank the Eckerd Mockley Committee for honoring me with this award. I have a few other colleagues who have participated in my career that I would like to thank. Um, I'll talk a little bit about simultaneous multi-threading because that is one of the major reasons that I'm standing here. And then finally, um, I'd like to say a few words to the female architects who are with us today. My, my thanks to the Eckert Mockley Committee is, is not your usual thank you so much for giving me this award. Uh, it's much more encompassing. I'd like to thank you for breaking another uh, professional glass ceiling. <laughs> In my view, there are numerous women who could be standing here. It, it just happens to be me. And at least in my opinion, uh, the important event is that uh, the technical work of a female architect has been recognized. I hope it continues. So, thank, you. thank you, thank you to all six of those barrier breakers um, for making a little history in our field. Um, I'd like to emphasize that the Eckert Mockley Award uh, is not the only event that in our community that is making it more open, more diverse, a little more inclusive. I'd like to recognize also the, the efforts of five women in particular who are sort of paving the way in this direction. Catherine McKinley, Margaret Martinosi, Kim Hazelwood, Natalie enright Jurger, and Sarita Edve. Um, truth be told, however, this kind of change can't take place unless we're sort of all on board um, and involved, both senior and junior, both male and female. And I'm really happy to see all of the activities that are taking place at the moment. Um, I have also uh, tons of colleagues. I have always collaborated. So there are like over a hundred of these people. I will not list them. Uh, but they're both in architecture and in compiler technology. I would like to have you see like uh, the people who worked on SMT, at least with the UW group, beginning with our first students, Dean Tolson, who is now chair at UC San Diego, and Jack Lowe, they're a little ahead of me, <laughs> um, who worked at VMware for a long time and is now a director at Google, and ending with Mike Swift, who's a full professor at Wisconsin. The biggest thanks, though, goes to my longtime collaborator, not just on SMT, but a lot of other projects as well, Hank Levy. 
Um, he is also the longtime chair of my department, now the director of the Paul Allen School of Computer Science at UW. Um, Hank, Hank and I were amazingly compatible collaborators. Uh, we, we had somewhat different skill sets. He was better on the conceptual side, I was better in experimentation, but we shared what he always called the same research values. Okay. We never submitted before the work was ready for prime time. We were willing to spend an inordinate amount of time on the last 5%, you know, whether it was a talk, a paper, an idea, or mentoring a student. We never argued, and we always had fun. And in the end, we published about uh, 12 dozen papers on simultaneous multi-threading, ranging from microprocessors to parallel programming to operating systems to compilers. The, the general course of my career, uh, I don't think would have happened had I not been in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at UW. This was a department that believed in collaboration and research, and not just research, teaching as well, long before it became Okoron. Long before I got there, actually. And they didn't just believe in it, they practiced it and they rewarded it. I, I do not think I would have been or had the same career, certainly not the same success, if I had been in a department of faculty fiefdoms. Um, and I'm very, very happy that I happened to land there. Lastly, uh, I'd like to thank the sort of so-called anonymous uh, colleagues who, and I say anonymous because um, we're not really supposed to know who they are, but in actual fact we kind of do know who they are, who write letter after letter, year after year. You know, how, how tedious must this be? But I am very grateful and it made all the difference. So thank you uh, to whoever you are. I had a bit of a circuitous route to becoming a computer architect. Uh, in 1965, right out of college, I was a secretary in the economics department at Yale. One day, my boss asked me to write a computer program, new term, uh, that would multiply matrices. These were the days when, if you wanted to multiply matrices, it was an entire program. Previously, I had been doing these calculations manually on a, a calculator. Marshawn calculator. So I, I bought a book on Fortran uh, by McCracken. I read it over the weekend and I was totally transformed. Computer programming, as it turns out, is intellectually very much the same as devising the offensive strategy in Bridge. So I stopped playing Bridge, I stopped being a secretary, and I became a programmer. Um, about the same time, I became involved in the nascent, nascent uh, national women's movement, uh, which gave me a very different mindset about what a woman could say, what a, what a woman could be, or think. That a woman could have a career. You know, this was really important. I had been raised in the 50s, where, when little girls should be seen and not heard. And I was having rather a hard time doing that. <laughs> Many, many steps later, uh, I got a job at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs uh, with a research group, database research group. My first day on the job, uh, expecting an orientation of some sort um, from my boss, uh, but instead he said, and this is all he said, you know, look around, pick a problem, and work on it. You know, I'm a novice applications programmer. I thought, what on earth is a problem? <laughs> But I looked around. Most of them were doing uh, work in statistical databases, which largely was zeros, like 85% or more of zeros. And, and this was in a day when disks were huge and expensive. Wasteful, I thought. So I devised a compression algorithm that got rid of all those zeros, but also gave you hooks so you could get them back if you really needed them, like if you actually wanted to compute rather than just store the data. And this, I believe, was my ticket to EEC, EECS at Berkeley. I was almost 40. Uh, the rest, Quinley has kind of spelled out, it was a more normal career after that. <laughs> now let's talk about, a little about simultaneous multi-threading. 
Um, and I'm speaking mostly to those of you who became architects in the 21st century because the bulk of our work, at least at, at UW, uh, was the century previous to that. And I will tell this, you know, this is sort of my own story. We all in this group have ever so slightly different memories of what happened and why. And so you will hear it from my viewpoint today. Simultaneous multi-threading, uh, first of all, it's an out-of-order processor that executes instructions from multiple threads at the same time. You know, really, at the same time, the same cycle. Uh, this eliminates both hardware and software context switching, therefore sort of converting thread-level parallelism into a kind of global cross-thread instruction-level parallelism. And this TLP to um, ILP conversion is, what, is what, one of the two factors that provides a really big performance boost, uh, measured in X, not in percent, like 1.5, 2, 3, and for some programs even 4. I'll, measure the, I'll, I'll mention the other one a little later. Okay. So how did SMT do this? Well, there were a number of factors, but I think a really important one was the instruction fetch algorithm, which we called iCount. iCount fetches instructions from the threads that have the fewest instructions in the pre-execution stages of the pipeline. In other words, it's picking the threads that are making the best progress through the machine. It doesn't care why they are making good progress. It doesn't care why the others are not making good progress. Presumably, they're stalled on some long latency operation. It just picks the threads that are doing the best, thereby increasing throughput of the whole workload. The second source of performance benefit was that the threads shared almost all the hardware resources, both the hardware data structures and the logic, caches, DLBs, instruction fetch logic, the iBuffer, functional units, and so forth. And this is something commercial applications didn't do, or at least they didn't do to the same extent. Um, and it was important, particularly in 1994, uh, when there was only one thread executing all by itself, which at that time was, of course, the common case. We weren't multi-threading yet. And it's the same sort of benefit that unified caches give you know, to both instructions and data. If one thread wanted to be a hardware hog, it could be a hardware hog. There were no sort of hardware firewalls to separate threads. Our original uh, motivation for SMT stemmed from a series of studies we did trying to figure out why on earth wide issue superscalers weren't getting better performance. I mean, they were wide, after all. They had lots of hardware. They had sophisticated hardware because transistors were already increasing at this point. What we found was that there was no one single cause of performance degradation, that we were just being nickeled and dimed all over the place. And that in fact, if you fixed one source of bottleneck, like a problem in branch prediction, uh, the bottleneck just shifted someplace else and you didn't really get a huge boost in performance. So what this said to us was that we couldn't we wouldn't find better performance if we just had a grab bag of individual techniques, each targeting a different hardware component, that we had to come up with some general solution, and for us, that solution was threads. We also realized that to have real impact, we had to show that SMT was implementable. So in this day, the microprocessor industry was tr still transitioning from in-order to out-of-order processors, and people, some people, some of us were still sort of grappling with what exactly should an out-of-order processor look like? I mean, modern out-of-order processor, not Thomas Hulu. And so we, it was a bit of a stretch, I think, to get them to accept that an out-of-order machine provided most of the mechanism that you needed for executing multiple threads. So we asked Joel Emmer if he would like to join our project. Joel was a digital at the time. And he was an alpha CPU architect. And he said yes. And he brought with him uh, Rebecca Stamm, who was a processor engineer. Soon later, we published our second paper. This was the one on implementation. And that paper caught the attention of Intel. Um, uh, what caught their attention was, um, of course, the content of the paper showing that out of order could facilitate threads, but also that Joel was on the author list. <laughs> what was digital doing on the SMT project? And that began 
um, the beginning of the hyper-threading effort and in Intel, at least as told to me by a former insider uh, who was on the project. Digital built SMT. And Joel demonstrated that the performance results that we got on our simulators and their simulator, they were they more or less matched, uh, could be built with uh, very little additional hardware, like in the realm of 15%. It was the Alpha EV6, or 21464, or at least it would have been. Uh, at about the same time, uh, Intel bought the Alpha technology from Compact, which had bought digital years before, and the Alpha lost out to the x86. So although it was the next machine to go into production, the 21464 was never built, never sold. And I will say this was a major, major professional heartbreak for us all. Lastly, I would like to share, uh, particularly with the younger female architects, something that really helped my research and actually also my teaching career. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I realized early on that I was really not very good at talking on the fly. So I began thinking ahead about what I would talk about when people asked me about my work or about any of the issues of the day. Elevator talks they're now called. I had tons of them. Uh, and th there are just countless ways in which they benefited me, both little and big, and I'd like to tell you about one of them. So uh, one day John Cock from IBM came to Berkeley to give a talk, and Dave Patterson invited um, some of his students, including me, to have lunch with him. We were intimidated. You know, this was the famous uh, John Cock, Turing Award winner for his uh, wonderful work in compiler optimization and a microarchitecture which would later be called RISC. So being polite, he asked you know, each one of us, inter he's a southern gentleman, or was, he's passed, passed away, he asked each one of us what we were working on. The first student said, I'm in systems. The second student said, I do what he does. <laughs> and when it came to me, I said, I rolled out the elevator talk. I said, this is the problem I'm working on. It was cash coherence at the time. Uh, this is why it's an important problem. This is the tack of my solution, and this is how my solution is different from the rest of the pack. <laughs> so we're walking out of the rest. This is the three C's, Mark. We're walking, this is a you know, compulsory, comp you know, et cetera. Uh, we're walking out of the restaurant at students in front and John and Dave behind, and I can hear him saying, who's that girl in systems? <laughs> okay, not exactly politically correct, and he had the wrong area, right? uh, but he had noticed. And soon thereafter, I, after I find myself with an IBM fellowship that paid for three years of my graduate study, and not only that, um, when I interviewed, I had lots of offers from IBM, actually more offers than any woman had ever had in the history of IBM. And when I chose academia rather than industry, IBM funded my compiler research for several years. John Cock was behind all of this. Bless his heart. So what's the message here? Actually, there are two messages. Uh, one is, you know, try to figure out what you're good at, what you're not good at, um, and compensate for the latter. And the second is the, how invaluable mentors are. Get one, or actually get several. You know, they won't leave you, and they really are invaluable. Dean. Okay, so one last thought. Um, although I have left the realm of computer architecture, I am still an architect, a landscape architect. This is a huge uh, retirement passion of mine. I have, I have turned a, a backyard, a half acre backyard hillside, steep hillside, 45 degree angle, of blackberries, horsetails, and bog into really a lovely little garden uh, with small trees, shrubs, perennials, ground covers, with uh, stone paths, you know, weaving their way up the hillside. I've channeled the bog into a stream coming down. Okay. And it's you know, open to the public like in some form every year. I love it. 
I would say retirement is also not so bad. <laughs> I, I need to thank you one more time. I mean, thank you so much to the Eckerd Mockley Committee. I, I'm filled with gratitude, and I am absolutely thrilled to have this award. Thank you. All.